All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So right now in present time as I am recording this, it is Thursday, so I'm not sure what day or time of the day it is that you are watching this, but happy Thursday. I hope you're having a great day. So for today, we are gonna be talking about assembly, exit, and maturation. So in this topic, we're gonna split it into five parts. So the first thing we're gonna think about is the basics. So what determines how a virus is formed, where does this assembly actually happen, which is going to lead us into, well, how does assembly actually happen? How do the different protein subunits come together? And then of course, as part of the virus, we have the nucleic acid. So how is the correct nucleic acid packaged into the virion? And for those viruses that have an envelope, where does the envelope come from and how does that occur? And last but not least, of course, we have to release the progeny viruses. So we will compare the release of naked and enveloped viruses. So in our little schematic of our typical life cycle of a virus, we are finally out of step two, which was the longest step ever. So thinking about all of the different ways to make nucleic acid from RNA or from DNA. So we are finally in these last two steps here. So we're gonna talk about now that we have made all of the pieces, how do those pieces come together and how do the progeny actually exit the cell? So the first thing we have to think about is, well, what actually determines how a virus is formed? So I would encourage you to pause the video and to take a look at the hint that is on the slide and see if you can come up with an idea. So hopefully you have paused the video and have spent a little bit of time thinking about it. If we take a look at all of the viruses that are shown on here, of course we've got some naked viruses over here, so some icosahedral naked viruses. We have adenovirus shown here. On the right we have coronavirus. If we take a look at all of these, we of course see different shapes. We should see different sizes, different structures. So what came into the cell? is what we want to come out of the cell. So the viral structure is what is going to determine how a virus is formed. So just like we talked about the structure and how the structure helps determine how a virus enters, when we talked about how a virion is built, we looked at the architecture. That architecture and that structure is going to give us hints and how a virus will actually be formed once the parts are made. So again, another question for you to think about is, well, where does assembly actually happen? So again, I'm going to encourage you to pause the video and to think about your RNA viruses, your DNA viruses. Where are they being synthesized? Their nucleic acid, that is. Is that happening in the nucleus? Is it happening in the cytoplasm? So again, go ahead and pause the video and take a minute or so to kind of work through that. All right, so where is this assembly happening? We can kind of split it up into two different places. So we can think about the nucleus. So within the nucleus, this is going to be many of the DNA viruses. And so examples of this are going to be the polyoma viruses. It's going to be things like adenovirus, your herpes viruses, any of the single-stranded DNA viruses as well, so parboviruses. All of these, their destination when they enter the cell is to go to the nucleus, particularly for those single-stranded DNA viruses. They have to be fixed in a sense to be made double-stranded. From there, we can replicate them. And so most of those viruses are going to be assembled in the nucleus. But of course, on the other half of the cell, we've got the giant cytoplasm there. And so within the cytoplasm, this is going to be mostly your RNA 
viruses. Now again, there's going to be exceptions to that rule. So an exception to that is going to be our influenza, which we know heads to the nucleus where it completes cap snatching because it needs that cap from a host mRNA to serve as a primer for its replication. So part of that will of course be an exception, although again, you could argue that in the last step, it does start assembling its final piece at the host plasma membrane, which is in the cytoplasm. So we will kind of see that some viruses are exclusively in the nucleus, exclusively in the cytoplasm, and some kind of do a little bit here and a little bit there. And so we're going to include in the cytoplasm, we'll see a lot of our endomembrane system involved in this. So we'll see the ER, we'll also see the Golgi. And as we get into the endomembrane system, we'll actually draw it out as a reminder to ourselves of how it functions and what it looks like. All right, so moving forward, we kind of know where assembly is happening. And so what do we need to begin assembly? And again, I encourage you to go ahead and pause the video and to think about the pieces that we've been building so far in this semester and what we're actually going to need for this step. So again, hopefully you have not cheated yourself and hopefully you have paused that video and you've jotted some ideas down in your notes. We are going to need our capsid proteins. So whether the virus is a naked virus or whether it has a nucleocapsid in the case of an envelope virus, we're going to need our proteins that build our capsid. Of course, by this point, we better have copied that genetic material. So that really long step that seemed like we spent forever on all the different ways to make RNA and DNA, um, we better have that completed. And then, of course, we're going to need anything else that is packaged with the virus. And so we can kind of think about some of those RNA viruses, um, particularly the ones that have to go from negative RNA to positive RNA. Well, we don't have anything in our cells that can read RNA and make RNA, so they have to package their RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So if we are assembling a new progeny virus, we of course want the progeny virus to have that, so that's a great example. Another great example is tRNA in the case of HIV. So HIV requires that tRNA to serve as a primer, so it's going to want to make sure that it packages that. Of course, we can think about any of the other proteins that come along with HIV, so your, your reverse transcriptase, your integrase protein. Um, there are, of course, I'm going to say other proteins that need to be made, so those could be your spikes in the case of adenovirus, any glycoproteins that you need for those enveloped viruses, which of course means we are somewhere going to need an envelope, and that's going to come from the host, and we'll talk about the different ways that viruses have to acquire those envelopes throughout this topic. So hopefully a lot of these things made your list as you were brainstorming before we talked about it together. All right, so kind of moving forward, we're going to think about, well, what are the reactions that these viruses have to complete? So as humans, we love to have things in steps and we love to have order. So we're going to talk about things that all viruses do. So in this dark blue color, this is going to be all, and I'm going to put an asterisk because of course we know that there's an exception to every single rule. And then in this lighter blue here, we're going to differentiate the enveloped viruses. So we'll write the steps that all viruses do and then the steps that only envelope do. And we're going to try to kind of do it in the order that these things happen. So the first thing that we want to do is this idea of formation of structural units. So when we talked about virion architecture, we talked about structural units and how that count and how those come together. 
So as we make those structural units, we're going to have to assemble a capsid. And again, this assembly of a capsid we will see can happen in different steps. So we'll talk about all the different examples. And the most important part of Hearst is going to be selectively packaging of the nucleic acid. And so we'll talk about how does a virus package its nucleic acid and not something else. And then those other components that we talked about. So again, in the case of HIV, how does it make sure that the reverse transcriptase is packaged? How does it make sure that the integrase is packaged? So on and so forth. In the case of an enveloped virus now, somewhere in all of this, we're going to have to acquire an envelope. And then next we're gonna have release from a host cell. And then finally, we are gonna have maturation of a viral particle. And even though I wrote this in the color of the enveloped viruses, we will see that that is not always the case. Not all viruses always do maturation, but we will talk about a handful of examples of viruses that complete this maturation step. And so there are people in the fields of virology that actually argue that these end steps in terms of releasing from a host, because of Hearst, the goal is to make progeny virions that can then go on to restart the infection process, that that is one of the most important steps. Because if you release progeny that can't complete step one, which is finding a host and attaching to a host, then in a sense you have failed. And so we're going to talk about all these things and kind of work on putting all these pieces together. So if Hearst's viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, we can't talk about what's going on in this step of assembly and release without thinking about what the host is doing. The host is very much so an active part of everything that is happening. So again, I will encourage you to pause the video and to brainstorm what you think the host might be completing at this step. So again, I hope that you've taken the time to, in your notes, jot down some ideas and hopefully they match up to some of the things that I'm going to tell you. And that first thing is energy. So the host has to be providing energy during this step. And the reason for this has to go back to the idea of diffusion. So when we talked about how viruses entered, we brainstormed, well, when they enter, what happens next if they have to get to the nucleus? How do they get to the nucleus? Well, we know that diffusion doesn't happen in terms of getting a virus from point A to point B because the cytoplasm is way too crowded. There is no way that without a form of input of energy that the virus would be able to get from the plasma membrane to the nucleus. And so if we're going backwards now because we want to exit the cell, so we have to get from the nucleus to the plasma membrane, again, that's going to require energy. And a lot of that energy is going to be used for motor proteins. So those motor proteins that walk along or move along the microtubules are going to help us transport all of the viral pieces that we need to assemble the virions. Another big part of this is going to be nuclear import and nuclear export. So we know that we have mentioned that some viruses assemble in the nucleus, but proteins are made in the cytoplasm, so we have to have a way of taking those proteins and moving them back into the nucleus. And then, of course, we have to have a way for getting those viruses from the nucleus out into the cytoplasm and then outside of the plasma membrane as well. So we're going to kind of, as we go through this topic, pull in all of these pieces. 
So I've kind of mentioned it already um, without fully giving away the answer yet, but we've at least mentioned the problem, if you will. And that's this idea that, well, if viruses can assemble in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm, but in a eukaryotic host, the viral proteins are made in the cytoplasm, be it on a free ribosome or a ribosome embedded in the ER, well, how does the viral protein know where to go? If we have to assemble a virus in a nucleus, it better get to the nucleus. So how do we get those viral proteins there? So again, I'm going to ask you to pause the video here and think back to your 185 class that you had your first year here at Hanover and see if you can pull in some of that information. All right, so welcome back after pausing the video, or at least hopefully you have paused the video and you have brainstormed. So did you get it? Did you think about um, when we talked about protein transport and the endomembrane system in 185? And for those of you that have had biochemistry, you've probably talked about this in biochemistry as well. Well, I'm going to relate the... Um, solution, if you will, to something that we typically have. And that's going to be a postcard. So maybe, especially now in the quarantine that we have where we're all sitting at home, maybe you want to send someone a postcard or you want to send them a letter. So the way that we do that is, of course, via an address. It's not like the mail people know exactly where everything goes. The only way that they know where your postcard or your letter has to go is because of the address. Well, it turns out that proteins, be it viral proteins or host proteins, the way that they know how to go is through two things. It's going to be through signal peptides. And so signal peptides or signal sequences, they are part of the... Um, amino acids of the protein itself, so they're part of that polypeptide, and this is a string of amino acids that is essentially a signal of where the protein is headed. And so we know that proteins have directionality, so we have that N-terminus, and we have the C terminus, and we can have a signal sequence at those ends. Typically, it's on the end terminus, and again, it's a series of amino acids, and it tells the protein where to go. So it might tell it to go to the nucleus, it might tell it to go to the plasma membrane, so on and so forth. We can also, in addition to signal sequences, we can have protein tags. And so a great example of this is glycosylation. So we can have modification of proteins, we can add different tags, and a combination of these signal sequences, these signal tags, or these protein tags is going to help the cell determine where the protein needs to go. So again, these, even though this happens in the host naturally, viral proteins also have to have these pieces so that the viral protein gets to the correct place. All right, so now that we've got all of our basics, we've kind of introduced the idea of what the host is doing during this time. We've talked about where assembly is happening. Now we're ready to start putting the pieces together. So for assembly, we're gonna kind of split it up into two main kinds. And the two main kinds of assembly that we have are sequential capsid assembly, And as the name sequential capsid assembly implies, this is a step-by-step -step process. It's very ordered, and we will talk about why that is. And the second type of assembly that we have is something known as concerted assembly. And for concerted assembly, it more or less happens all at the same time.
But even though we have these two different kinds of assembly, first we are here to talk about the commonalities and um, something that we have been doing all semester is kind of drawing commonalities between all viruses and trying to make nice little rules for ourselves. So even though we have these two different kinds, we do have things in common. And the thing that we have in common is that whether you are doing sequential or concerted assembly, subassemblies are made. And so you can probably guess that moving forward, we are now going to talk about, well, what the heck is a subassembly? Why are they made? And what is going on with that? So for a subassembly, this is the idea that we are going to form discrete intermediate structures. So kind of this idea behind an assembly line. And so the question becomes, okay, well, why? Why are we making these sub-assemblies? What is the goal with that? And as you can probably start to hypothesize, well, like I just said, it's like an assembly line. When we have an assembly line that ensures quality control, so we want to ensure that any progeny that are formed are going to be good quality progeny so that they can restart the infection process. So again, that's ensuring the formation of progeny viruses. And so it's just, again, this idea of orderly formation, this idea of an assembly line. If you put a piece on wrong, you can take it off and you can try again. So let me kind of draw a picture to represent what I mean by that. And this will be a very simplified picture. And then we'll actually start to get into more specific examples. And so you can think of this idea of sequential um, capsid assembly or this idea of subassemblies as the pieces. And so for these pieces, they're again, just the idea of formation of intermediate structures. So I'm going to go ahead and as a bacteriophage biologist, you all know I love to talk about them whenever I can. So here's our little bacteriophage. This is what we started with. This is our goal. So we are going to copy the nucleic acid. We are going to make all of the capsid proteins. We are going to assemble the capsid. We're going to make all of the tail proteins, all of these pieces are going to come together to then form the progeny viruses. And again, the goal here is that they look like what the original viruses came in to ensure that progeny quality. Okay, so let's go ahead now and let's talk about some specific examples for sequential capsid assembly. And the examples that we're going to talk about are poliovirus and herpes virus. And so for sequential capsid assembly, in terms of our rules that we can have, um, we can say that this is for most DNA viruses. Now again, there are exceptions to this because as you know, poliovirus is not a DNA virus. But um, again, this is just kind of giving us some rules to kind of go by. So the first example that we are going to talk about is poliovirus. And so for poliovirus, this is going to happen in the cytoplasm. And the reason for that is poliovirus is going to replicate in the cytoplasm. And so we're going to assemble in the cytoplasm as well. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to draw 
the entire life cycle just to kind of start putting the pieces together. And so let's go ahead and draw our plasma membrane here. So we've got our plasma membrane that we've drawn and we're gonna go ahead and add our little polio virus. It's going to interact with its receptor CD155. That is going to cause endocytosis. So that virion then gets endocytosed. It's going to form a pore. Let's go ahead and draw a pore here with the endosome after protons are pumped in and the pH drops, which is going to cause release of its genetic information. So now we have our positive RNA genome. That positive RNA genome can be translated to make protein. Some of those proteins are going to be the capsid protein, so they make up those asymmetric units. And then, of course, we're going to have to take our positive RNA, copy it to negative RNA. That will then be copied back to positive RNA to copy the genome. And of course, we've talked about the molecular details of how this happens. And then we're going to take that copied genome and all of those proteins that we made and assemble it into progeny virus. And that virus will, of course, exit. We will talk about the exit and how that occurs later on in this topic, but for now, we're kind of just drawing it as exit, which of course means we can restart that cycle again. So this is an example of sequential capsid assembly in the cytoplasm. So all of the pieces are made. Of course, we've got the membrane vesicles that are involved in copying the nucleic acid. We've got all the ribosomes helping us to translate the RNA into protein. All of the proteins are then assembled to make this beautiful new capsid that has the RNA in it, and then that virus can exit. So this is a super simple example. Um, of course, things can get a little more complicated as well, right? So the larger that you get, it turns out, well, gets a little bit more complicated. So the second example that we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about a virus that actually assembles in the nucleus. And so I wanted to give you an example of something that assembles in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. And specifically, we're going to talk about herpes viruses, but this is actually very similar to uh, many phages, so bacteriophage, SF6, and P22, which as you all know, I spent some time working on those during my dissertation. And then this is also very similar to adenovirus. So again, we're specifically talking about the nucleus, but of course bacteria don't have nuclei, so this is gonna occur in their cytoplasm. But the process of how the sequential capsid assembly happens is gonna be very similar to what we're talking about today. So again, to just kind of practice drawing everything, we are gonna draw as best as we can the entire life cycle. So we're gonna start with our plasma membrane. Here is our herpes virus enveloped. That's glycoproteins. And so it's gonna attach and it's going to enter and we can have fusion at the membrane or in the endosome. So sometime later, after that virus is encoded, it's going to want to go to the nucleus and I'm actually going to move my nucleus over a little bit so I leave myself enough room to draw the life cycle. And using a microtubule and motor proteins, we are going to take that herpes virus and bring it close to the nucleus and at that nuclear pore complex, its double-stranded DNA will go into the nucleus. And once we have 
the double-stranded DNA, we can start making a couple pieces. We can start replicating. So we're going to skip kind of over the rolling circle replication because we've talked about it. So we're going to go ahead and just draw our replicated genome. We can, of course, have transcription and processing that occurs. So we're going to have mRNA that is produced. It can be spliced. That is going to get shipped out. We're going to make protein. And then those proteins are actually, many of them are actually going to be needed in the nucleus. So if we are making our capsid pieces, those actually now have to be shipped back into the nucleus. And so they have to have those tags. And those tags are going to tell the host, hey, I know we made this in the cytoplasm, but this is needed in the nucleus. And so they will be imported back into the nucleus. So now that we have gone through the process of replication, we've made the viral protein. So we've done transcription, translation. We're ready to start assembling the pieces. And herpes virus does this very different than polio. In polio, um, we have all of those pieces that kind of beautifully come together. And while that happens in herpes virus, we actually need scaffolding. And so this is what is a little different compared to polio. And so what's going to happen is we're going to make something called a procapsid. And this procapsid is going to have scaffolding proteins. So these little circle pieces here are going to be my scaffolding proteins. Just like when you build a house, you have a foundation and then you build on top of that. Well, our scaffolding proteins are going to be on the inside of the capsid and they're going to help us assemble the pieces. So we're going to have our scaffolding protein and then around that, we're actually going to start building the capsid because again that scaffolding protein is going to help us with that and as this is herpes virus we of course cannot forget our portal protein and we also although it's not drawn in this picture we're going to have proteins that help us pump that dna into um, the capsid so part of it happens with that portal protein but of course um, the portal protein itself is not the only protein responsible for that so we've got those um, pink proteins that are meant to represent our pentamers and hexamers coming together to form our capsid and then over time as that nucleic acid goes in, we actually get capsid, or what we call, I should say, capsid maturation. And after capsid maturation, we get our nucleocapsid. So here is our beautifully assembled herpes virus that is fully mature now. And so as we package the DNA, so during this capsid maturation, we're going to package the DNA. The scaffold proteins are actually digested by proteases. So they end up doing this really cool thing where they kind of shoot out from the capsid. And then we have this entire process of capsid maturation happen. So the capsid actually kind of expands. And of course, as we know with herpes virus, they have extremely high pressure inside of the capsid as well. So again, two very different examples of sequential capsid assembly. One, poliovirus in the cytoplasm, that's a little more simple, and then a more complex example that requires the building of a procapsid and then requires capsid maturation, herpes virus, which occurs in the nucleus. Okay. So for concerted assembly, so we've talked about our, this idea of making subassemblies and doing sequential. Now we have to talk about concerted assembly. So for concerted assembly, there's a very key point that we have to remember, and that is that this only happens in association with the viral genome. 
And for concerted assembly, there's a couple of examples that we're going to talk about. And again, we can kind of make rules, if you will, um, or have little divisions and boxes that help us organize which viruses do what. And we'll see that a lot of negative stranded RNA viruses, we're going to do concerted assembly. The retroviruses, so in this class we've been talking a lot about HIV, are going to do concerted assembly. And then we actually have some positive RNA viruses that can do concerted assembly. Okay, so we are going to talk about an example of a virus that does concerted assembly. And the example that we are going to talk about is influenza. And once again, we're going to draw the entire life cycle just to kind of remind ourselves of putting all of the pieces together. So we're going to start with our plasma membrane. As always, we're going to add our little receptor there, so our sialic acid. Here's our lipid bilayer with our um, hemagglutinin and our neuraminidase. And I'm going to go ahead and draw our RNA-dependent RNA polymerase with our segmented genome. Of course, influenza viruses have more than two segmented genomes, but for sake of simplicity, I'm going to go ahead and just draw two just to kind of, again, get the point across here. So we're going to go and have endocytosis. And again, this should be review for you. And we're going to have membrane fusion with the endosome. So as that virus is endocytosed, we get protons that are pumped into the endosome. That's going to cause a pH-dependent um, conformational change in that F-peptide, which is going to cause fusion of the membrane of influenza with the membrane of the endosome. And as this is happening, so let's go ahead and draw our nucleus here. So there's our double membrane for the nucleus with our nuclear pore. During this step, of course, the host is involved. So there's our microtubule. Here is our endosome that has fused with the viral membrane. It's being walked along to the nucleus. There's our genome that will enter the nucleus. Now, the flu has negative RNA. So we're going to go ahead and draw our antisense. This is going to then be copied to positive RNA, back to negative RNA. So we talked about the molecular details of the genome replication in an earlier topic. So we're going to kind of just leave it simplified. And then this negative RNA is, of course, also at some point we have to make positive RNA to make the mRNA. That mRNA is then going to be shuffled out of the nucleus. We are going to use the ribosomes to translate it to make protein. And the first thing of course that we have to do is we have to make viral protein because if you remember back to when we talked about the genome replication of influenza, one of the things that we have to do is we actually have to coat the RNA with that nucleocapsid protein, which continues pushing the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase along so it doesn't stutter and fall off so that we are able to make a full-length genome copy. So one of the proteins that a person has made in the cytoplasm is going to be that nucleocapsid protein. So you probably guessed it, one of those proteins is going to have to be shuffled back into the nucleus. So as you can see, we're kind of going back and forth here from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And of course, the way that that is completed is going to be completed with those tags that are on those proteins. So now we have protein in the nucleus. And we can kind of add to this genome replication that we have here, and we can make this a little cleaner and actually show that we have our 
me get my five primes and three primes correct here. So show that we have our five primes and our three primes. All right, so we've got our nucleic acid there, and we're gonna coat that with that um, nucleocapsid. And then first, well, that nucleocapsid protein, that genome, it has to make it back out to the cytoplasm. So that will, let's continue our nucleus here. So let's draw ourselves another little nuclear report. So that genome is gonna be shuffled out into the nucleus. Now while all this is happening, we are also going to have to be making our other proteins. Well, if we think back to what our influenza looks like, our influenza has hemagglutin and it has neuraminidase. Well, those have to somehow make it to the plasma membrane because influenza is going to do concerted assembly and it's all going to kind of come together more or less at the same time at the plasma membrane. So while we're making nucleocapsid protein that is sent back to the nucleus, we're also going to be making other proteins. And some of these other proteins are going to be our hemagglutin and our neuraminidase. So let's go ahead and we'll stick some of those in the plasma membrane. And again, the way that they get there is going to be through those tags. Those tags are those signals or those addresses that send everything together. So we're going to take our genome that we have copied and we're going to have to have an RNA dependent RNA polymerase that comes with us. We're gonna have our genome, of course it's coated here with that nucleocapsid protein. All of that is going to come together and we'll actually come back to this step. So for now we're kind of saying that all this comes together and that if we continue our plasma membrane here, that we end up with budding that occurs. So this idea of exocytosis in the case of things like influenza, it, we call it budding. And so budding is just releasing of these progeny virions. So let's be complete here and draw our progeny influenza. And so we call this process, again, budding. And we will come back to envelope acquisition in part four. So you'll actually see me refer back to this. Um, but for now, just kind of trust me that this is how it happens. And again, like I said, we will come back to this idea. And one of the things that is a challenge for influenza and for some of these viruses that have segmented genomes is, well, we want to make sure we get the right pieces in, right? So if you came in with eight segmented genomes, you should probably have the right, correct eight segmented genomes. And different viruses have different ways of solving this problem. There's definitely evidence when it comes to influenza that there are signals on the nucleic acid that make it so that all of the correct segmented genomes are packaged so that you don't exact you don't accidentally get eight copies of segmented genome three, that you get a copy of each one. And so again, we don't fully know everything about it, but we do know that there are some signals that happen that are signal sequences, I should say, that are on the nucleic acid. For other viruses, so for some bacteriophages, um, they actually have to go in step by step. So genome segment one has to go in, that's a signal for genome segment two to come in, which is a signal for genome segment three to come in, so on and so forth. So again, different viruses have evolved different strategies for this. Um, and so that is a problem that we're not going to spend too much time talking about because it could be a lecture in and of itself, but I did kind of want to mention it and bring it to your attention. So the very last thing that we are going to talk about in this part of assembly is HIV. So we have drawn the first part of the HIV life cycle multiple times, and I'm gonna give you a hint here because we just talked about concerted assembly for influenza. It turns out 
that HIV also does concerted assembly. And so it's going to be very similar to influenza. So I'm going to go ahead and challenge you to pause the video right now and to go ahead and draw the entire HIV life cycle. Again, you don't have to draw all the nitty gritty details. So that whole reverse transcriptase hopping back and forth between the pseudo diploid genome, crazy rearrangement that happens. So you can leave all that out and shorthand it, but try to put all of the pieces together. So again, pause the video, complete the challenge, and then when you restart, we'll come back and I'll actually walk you through my model of how um, I envision this happening. All right, so I hope that you have paused the video and you have challenged yourself to complete this. So again, for HIV, it's very similar to flu. So we're going to have concerted assembly that occurs. I'm going to go ahead and start with my plasma membrane as I always do. HIV requires a co-receptor so I'm going to go ahead and just draw two receptors up there. HIV has that club-shaped capsid. It's got that pseudo diploid genome. And then we have our glycoprotein, so there's our GP120. We're going to have fusion at the plasma membrane. So unlike the flu, which fuses with the endosome, HIV of course fuses at the plasma membrane. And so after that occurs, we have our nucleocapsid that has entered our RNA, our genome, is going to then be reverse transcribed. And the reverse, transcripti, reverse transcription, excuse me, happens in the cytoplasm. Let's go ahead and draw our nucleus here. So over time, we're going to have double-stranded DNA. And that's going to come along with our integrase. So we have that integration complex that forms. That then gets shuffled into the nucleus. So let's go ahead and make our host DNA. We'll make it pink. That integrase complex going to integrate the HIV genome. So here is our HIV genome integrated. Now, unlike our other viruses, HIV, of course, the only way out is to copy itself um, or to transcribe itself, I should say, from that genetic information. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to do some transcription. So there's our RNA. And at the beginning of the life cycle, we are, of course, going to be splicing. So I'll we'll make shorter transcripts. Those shorter transcripts are going to get exported out of the nucleus. And they're going to go into the cytoplasm. They are going to be translated by ribosomes to make protein. And one of the problems that we talked about that HIV has is this idea that, well, that RNA gets spliced. We have to have splicing that occurs. We put a tag on that this RNA has been spliced, which allows our nuclear export factor to bind to it and export it out of the nucleus. But HIV doesn't want its genome splice. So how do we stop that? We talked about this special protein that HIV encodes for, and that protein is REV. So one of the proteins that is made is REV, and that has to go back into the nucleus. And so now in this topic, we've introduced this idea of having a signal tag. That signal tag is going to tell that REV protein to go back into the nucleus, which allows us to stop splicing and allows the entire unspliced genome to come out. So I'm gonna call this here 
unspliced genome. So that Rev protein is going to bind to that. It basically tricks the host into thinking that the RNA has been spliced so that the nuclear export factor can bind. And now that unspliced genome also is going to exit the cell. So we're going to kind of come back around to our plasma membrane here. So further down in the cell, um, we know that HIV has those glycoproteins. So while all of this is happening in the cell, we are also making glycoproteins. Although it's not drawn here, those glycoproteins are going to go through the endomembrane system, which we'll kind of touch on shortly here. And they're going to be embedded just like they were for flu into the plasma membrane. And we're going to start also making a first capsid protein. So we got to make all of the pieces. So we're going to start putting all of those pieces and assembling them at the plasma membrane. We also need, so we've got our unspliced genome. Let's match our colors here. So here's our pseudodiploid genome. Of course, for progeny viruses to be successful, we're going to need integrase to be packaged as well. We're going to need some reverse transcriptase to be added. So all of these pieces are starting to be assembled at the plasma membrane. And then just like with influenza, we have budding at the plasma membrane which is going to result in progeny viruses, and this process can restart. So we are actually skipping a maturation step that occurs. So I'm going to go ahead and just write maturation happens in this little arrow here for now. And we will actually come back to that during part two of topic 10. So for now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to stop at part two. And the first video will be parts one and part two of topic 10. And then we're going to talk about packaging, acquisition of an envelope, even though we've kind of hinted at it today already. We've talked about for those viruses that do concerted assembly at the plasma membrane that the envelope comes from the plasma membrane. And then we'll also talk about release. So for now, this is the end of um, video part one of topic 10. And I will hope to see you soon in video part two of topic 10. All right. Thanks, everyone. And have a wonderful rest of your day.